everybody. Buenos dias. Um, I'm Olga Segura, I'm one of the co-founders of the Latinx House. Our mission is to celebrate the excellence in our community across all the industries. Um, I'm really excited to introduce my fellow co-founder, Monica Ramirez, who's going to be moderating um, this next panel. Thank you. Good morning. How are you all feeling? Good. We are so thrilled to see you. And we are ecstatic to talk about the power of Latinas who are building the pipeline. And I am honored to be here in conversation with some incredible Latinas who are part of the building of this pipeline. Next to me, I have Mia Maestro, who is an actor. She's starred in award-winning films like Tango, Frida, Motorcycle Diaries, and most recently, she's had a film premiere at Sundance Film Festival that is called uh, Cow Who Sang Into the Future. And we're gonna hear more about that today. We also have with us Elaine Del Valle, who's an actor, director, a casting agent, and author. Ooh. I mean, she's, she's got a lot of hats she's wearing <laughs> over here, Elaine. Um, and she also has a, a, the first part of a series in the film that she's making called Brownsville Bread that premiered here at South by Southwest 22 that we are gonna hear more about. <laughs> and Ileana Sosa is joining us. Hi, Ileana. She is a documentary and narrative filmmaker who's based here in Austin. She's a Texan. She grew up in El Paso. And, <laughs> and many of the stories that she has told through her film have been based on her own life and some of her experience. Um, in addition to being a filmmaker, she's also, we need to celebrate this and give big love because she is also a former Bill Gates Millennium Scholar. <laughs> So thank you all for joining us. We're gonna jump right into talking about this pipeline that's being built. So Mia, we just, I mentioned that you had a film that just premiered at Sundance. Did. How did that feel? Tell us about that. It felt amazing to premiere it. It felt slightly sad to do it virtually and not in person. That's why it's been so wonderful to be here at South by South and you know, film is, we enjoy it and we build it in community and you know we just miss the audience but um, it's a beautiful film it's directed by Francisca Alegria a wonderful Chilean director who had won I believe in 2017 the um, best short at Sundance it's a film that we um, developed with the Sundance Institute so we started with a, a few pages of the script in uh, the director's lab, and over the years, we built together. Uh, my co-star is the wonderful Chilean actress, Leonor Varela, and, uh, and we did it in Chile last year in the middle of a pandemic uh, with a full, full lockdown. So the film itself, it was a miracle <laughs> that we got to actually <laughs> film it. Um, and it was also, uh, talking about pipeline, it, it, it required co-production from many, many different countries, uh, France, Germany, the United States, and Chile involved. So, um, yeah, I'm very proud of it. It's a, it's a beautiful film. It's uh, very lyric lyrical, um, beautifully um, photographed by Inti Briones, uh, a film that our whole crew was mainly Chilean, not only Chilean, but local from Valdivia, where we shot it, which is not the capital, it is not Santiago. Uh, Francisca's um, was really a adamant about that because she believes like working with new technicians and giving opportunity to new people in the crew builds our our um, production power. Um, and um, and yeah, I hope you all get to see it. The title is "The Cow Who Sang a Song into the Future," La Vaca Que Cantó Una Canción Hacia el Futuro. So um, yeah, I can't wait to hear your feedback when you get to see it end of the year, hopefully. Thank you, Mia, and congrats. <laughs> now, Elaine, you are coming off of a very big day because your first part of your film just premiered, and it is based on a very beautiful personal story. I'd love for you to share with folks what Brownsville Bread is about and how it came that you made this first part of the film. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for this opportunity and for listening to me. Thank you, Monica, and the Latinx house. That means so much to so many filmmakers. Uh, when I first, I just have to say, when I first arrived um, to see Latinx house, I was just 
so inspired by the work that you are doing, and I appreciate it so much. In answer to your question, Brownsville Bread is the first act and serves as a proof of concept for my first feature film as a director, and it's based on my true story. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I like to say I'm a girl from the welfare projects of Brownsville, Brooklyn. My father was a heroin addict that died of AIDS, and my mother never made it past the seventh grade, and I'm proof that we can transcend our history. And thank you. <laughs> I feel that um, Brownsville Bread is just a girl's coming of age story. She happens to live in the neighborhood Brownsville and, and she's faced with uh, life and growing up and the milestones that make us who we are. And there's music in it, salsa music. My father was an amazing musician, salsa singer. And it's a story of joy mm -hmm. because no matter where we come from, there's joy and it's up to us to find it. And I hope that Brownsville Bread shares that story and it's, and it's much bigger than me and my personal story because the feature film is revealing the pitfalls of generational poverty mm -hmm. through this child. And we're letting her grow up through it and, and watching it and hopefully if you can see it, you can be it. It's a film that I feel that if I had seen it when I was a girl, it would have inspired me. And from the feedback that I'm getting, it is inspiring to others. And I also feel that it's not just for people like me or people that were like me as a child or people of poverty, but it really delivers a message of, of hope and family. And uh, it's, it's, it's everything that I ever wanted it to be. And it's also my most intimate story because as a director, we're always being asked. The question is, why are you the best person to tell this story? Mm. And I've been making films for a while now, and this is the one. I am the best person to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And I really um, am so grateful to South by Southwest for having me here. And hopefully people will see it and, and help me uh, finish what I started. I'm going to do it regardless, but I really would love the help. So thank you. I'm going to thank you. I want to piggyback on that, Elena. I don't want to leave that thought for a minute because I think it would be good for folks to understand when you say that you're going to continue it, people might think because it's just premiered here, the first part, that it's done. No, But it's, it's not, not done. done. So no. will you share more about that? Thank you, yes. So I wrote the feature film in four acts. And what I did with some grant money and other money that I raised, I, I got a grant from 150. And... I made the first act of my feature film never to be reshot because I don't want to waste a dollar. <laughs> so I consider grant, the grant money as soft money. And hopefully that actually um, attracts investors and, and lets them know, look, we've already put this in and now we're going to continue. I was speaking with the people at South by Southwest the other day and she said, yeah, we're going to premiere that uh, feature. <laughs> you know, like they want to see it win like that. So. So, so yes, I, I want to continue, and it, I wrote it like, um, if you think about love and basketball in four acts, so I consider it four chapters, four stages that tell the whole story that is a feature film that is Brownsville Bread is my directorial debut. And here at South by Southwest, the pilot category, if you read it carefully as to what it is, it actually is to help these projects flourish. They see the potential as as a bigger thing. So it's not just television pilots as they see it, it's actually a pilot in the sense of the word pilot, not a television pilot. So I hope people read that description and know what it is. Did I answer that question? You did, you did. Thank I you wanted. So I just wanted us to explore the fact that you're just getting started with this. It's not Absolutely. a finished project. Absolutely, miles to go before I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is the first time that the Latinx house is showing up and has set up a house here at South By, which is a big milestone for us. And while this is the first time that we are showing up, Ileana, you are like a South By Southwest pro. You have been here many times, and, and you have won for the films that you've created here. So many congrats for, for, your, for your work. Um, we you talked to us a little bit about your 2018 film that premiered? It, it won the Jury Award. I know that you um, made it in collaboration with Firelight Media and others. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of the other work that's been here? 
Yeah, actually, and I also have a film that j just had a world premiere, um, so I'd love to talk about of that. Of course. Um, yeah, so I, in 2018, I did um, a collaboration with Field of Vision and um, Firelight Media. It was a short doc called An Uncertain Future, um, and that won the uh, Texas Jury Award uh, back in 2018. Um, and then I just had my world premiere, my first feature documentary called What We Leave Behind on Friday. And we have, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's in the documentary spotlight section and we have one more screening tomorrow at Alamo at 2 p.m. And I'd love to see some of you there. And that's a personal documentary um, that follows my grandfather, Julian Moreno, who was a bracero. Um, he passed away in 2019, but when he was still alive, uh, the last year of his life, he decided to build a house in his pueblito uh, in Primo de Verdad, Durango, for our family to have a place to come home to. Um, and the film follows that last year of his life in the last construction project. And it's a, a very personal uh, love letter to him um, and to my family. And so it's just an honor to premiere it here um, at South By. Uh, it's a film I've been working on for the past seven years. And, um, you know, it's, it was just such a, a beautiful uh, privilege to be able to screen it with a live audience. Um, and it's just really overjoyed to be able to be here. Uh, Austin is now my hometown. I'm, I grew up in El Paso, born and raised. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now um, I'm here and I also teach at uh, UT Austin. I'm uh, an assistant professor there in um, teaching film production, tenure track. So there are more than 30 million Latinas in the United States, and we are a force to be reckoned with. Let's just, just, just say it. And our stories are so complex and so varied, but so undertold, and you are all changing that. I'd love to hear from all of you. How did you get into film? What made you decide to tell the stories that you're telling? Yeah. Um, well, I started right after high school in my country, Argentina, I started doing theater, and there was never a plan B for me. I just wanted to act, and that's what I did. And um, and my my first audition, it was with this beautiful director, Carlos Saura, from Spain, and um, and I got the role. So um, I I ended up at, at, you know, with a film that won an award at Cannes, and Oscar nominated, and uh, Golden Globe, so I had a really, really just blessed, you know, entry to this industry. And then I moved to Los Angeles and the industry was very, very different there. And um, I got there in 1999 and uh, we did not have the amount of roles or opportunities that we have right now. Um, and uh, it was a big, big learning process. Yet um, I was always, just embraced and welcomed by this beautiful Latin community. Um, some of my best friends, you know, one of them is Salma Hayek, who uh, was a star already or beginning her career, and uh, she helped me out a lot. So I feel like um, even from that moment onwards, like women in Hollywood helped each other, mm. and especially Latin women. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I like to say that many times because we normally get a different side of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there was not a lot of competition and we just helped each other a lot. So that was the beginning. And um, I always like to mention Salma because she was really a pioneer mm -hmm. for Latin women in Hollywood. She was the first one. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I stayed in the States and then going back and forth, doing a lot of Latin American and European films and also working in American productions and and then just building, you know, beautiful, career some years were really tough and you know you just like put you know all your energy in in um just staying present and um also as we were all said like i guess like just keeping the focus in telling personal stories and things that are important and stories that just speak to our heart and then speaks to like the audience's hearts so that's been kind of like my main focus throughout my my whole career. Thank you. I began my career as an actor. I studied acting under the legendary Wynne Handman, may he rest in peace, uh, at Carnegie Hall. And 
I was pretty successful in the commercial markets. I was on Dora the Explorer for 11 years. I was on every commercial for every major <laughs> brand, especially in Spanish. And this really speaks to the Latino market in, in the commercial market, but I was extraordinarily frustrated as an artist because I wasn't being given the opportunities to even audition for the roles that I felt most ripe for at my core. And so after three years of studying with Wynn, he took a summer hiatus and we started a writer's group in my apartment. And I just started writing. Everybody was just writing, whatever. And I had always, I had always been writing my whole life, but I never considered myself a writer. And I ended up writing what became my awarded one woman stage play, Brownsville Bread, which is now screening at South by Southwest, the proof of concept of it, the first act of the film. And um, I remember when I first put it on its feet in class, I said to Wynn, well, first let me backtrack because actually when I first got to the class three years before, I, I auditioned with a monologue that I wrote. And Wynn said, where did you get that? And I said, I wrote it. He said, you will not be doing anything that you write in this class ever. <laughs> it's always what I tell you to do in the scenes and everything. So when, but when he got back from hiatus, no one was assigned anything, and so I was allowed to choose my own material. And I started with a Shakespearean monologue, finished that, and I was like, let me just put it on its feet. And that's what I said, I'm putting it on its feet when it's something that I wrote. And when I was done, he said, you must keep writing this. Mm. And we need to hear that. Yeah. We, I needed to hear that, to know that the story had an impact, would matter, and when let me know that, and then audiences thereafter let me know that, and audiences from all walks of life let me know that the story was universal and that they got it, and, and uh, I started doing the festival circuit, and then I landed at, a, at the Schoolhouse Theater, which is regional theater, I did a run of it there, and then I did it off-Broadway, mm. and that was magical, and then I adapted it as a book, and I just had to keep going, and then, and then I got someone from the Multicultural Media Forum saw my play and said, you know, I have this thing where all the networks come, and I'm going to create a new session that's just called, like, the new artist platform or something, and you're gonna do a scene from your play. <laughs> and I was like, who's there? She said, all the networks are there. And she let me do that. And I did it, and I'm so lucky that somebody from um, HBO was there, Lucinda Martinez, actually. Mm -hmm. And she said, I wanna know everything you're doing from now on. And I thought, I'm gonna have a one-woman show on HBO, Epa! I'll be like John Leguizamo. <laughs> she said, no, don't get it twisted, okay? <laughs> she said, he's John Leguizamo, they're not gonna do that for you. I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> but I knew I was on the right path and I had to keep continuing to make content. Now, she's a very busy woman, as many of the executives are, they're going from place to place and negotiating, going from film festival to film festival, and I couldn't get her in the seat. And so to see the whole 90 minute play. And so I knew I had to start creating content. I wrote, produced, directed, and acted in a web series called Reasons Why I'm Single. Reasons, the letter Y, I'm single, is a comedy. <laughs> and um, I, didn't want, I didn't know that I could direct. It wasn't even like, I'm not gonna direct. I asked every director that I knew, please, can you direct this for me? No one wanted to do it. What's a web series, they mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I told a friend about it, and she said, Elaine, tell me about it. And I told her, and she said, it's clear to me that you're the director. Mm -hmm. And then I directed the first three, and then everybody started watching it, and everyone that I asked said, I'll direct the next one. And now, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> and so at first it was about directing the actors and the way that I wrote it, but then... I became so in love with directing that I learned the craft of directing 
and learn to inform the, 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 the story with the camera as much as I did with the directors. And I'm just so passionate about it now. So, and then someone else, Rashad Onesto Green, said to me, Elaine, make short films. That's going to make a difference. Forget about the web series. Keep going. Make short films. And then every year I committed to making one short film per year. And, uh, and, I, and I just keep growing. Last year, I was one of the winners of the Latinx Short Film Award for HBO. So you guys, thank you. So you can watch Princess Cut on HBO Max right now. I became a Warner Media 150 artist, and now it's, it's time. I'm, I'm ready to, to direct my first feature film, and Brownsville Bread is the first act of the first feature film. Um, of, of my first feature film as a director. Uh, and it's premiering here, and we're showing again on the 17th. We're online, as you know, everyone is online, whoever is a part of South by Southwest, virtually after their premiere. So um, make sure to watch it, vote for it. Our poster's beautiful, vote for that. <laughs> and th thank you, I think I took up enough time. <laughs> thank you, Elaine. Liliana. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, my journey to filmmaking was a bit I didn't grow up wanting to become a filmmaker or knew that I could. Um, it wasn't until I went to college um, at Southwestern near Austin that I had an amazing professor. Um, he, he already passed away, but his name was Dr. Daniel Castro, and he screened films like Bichote and Central Station in class and Black God, White Devil, things I had never seen before and were just really deeply influenced me. Um, and then I studied abroad in, uh, in Buenos Aires um, and took a documentary class down there. Um, and I fell in love with that. And I came back and he encouraged me to apply to film school. And you know, mind you, I had no, <laughs> I didn't know anything about filmmaking. Um, I was still an undergrad. I applied to UCLA to the MFA directing program. I got in in the first try. You know, not really knowing what <laughs> in the hell I was doing. Um, and yeah, I went to film school, you know, did four years there um, and lived in LA for about e eight years and did a lot of short, short fiction. Um, I directed uh, a feature of, well, a few years ago called Detained in the Desert. I collaborated with Josefina Lopez on it. it she wrote it and it was her play. Mm. Um, and then I segued into, I do both fiction and documentary, but I segued into documentary um, with that short and certain feature that was a South by Southwest a few years ago. Um, and I fell in love with documentary, and I, I love both fiction and doc, but honestly, just to be quite transparent, it, it's so much easier to get documentaries off the ground, um, especially in terms of funding, and even though this project took seven years to do, but um, I, uh, yeah, it, I, I started doing it on my own, just borrowing a camera and going down to shoot in Durango. Um, I had no funding at the time, producing, directing by myself, everything. Um, and it wasn't in the last few years, about three years ago that, you know, Sundance came in to support and the Ford Foundation um, field division. So that's how I was able to really get the project off the ground, hire a crew, which were all women cinematographers. I'm just happy to, to say that because I think it's important in all Latinas. Um, and I think that's another thing with this pipeline um, that's important. It's okay once we get to a certain, you know, spaces, right? It's like how do we then include our community back into it? How can we hire below the line crew? Um, because it's <coughs> that's how we start changing things. Um, and so it's just it's really been full circle to now be premiering my first feature documentary um, here. And um, you know, I'm excited to see what happens next. Um, but and I also say like what Elaine was talking about earlier in her upbringing, like I'm first generation Mexican American, first to go to college, first to be an artist. My parents have always worked all of their lives. I mean, all of my family, um, very working class jobs. And so I just also wanna say that for me to be, to think, you know, as a girl growing up in El Paso, oh, I'm gonna be a filmmaker one day and make films about my family. Like, you know, for me, that was just never, I never thought that was possible until I had, like Elaine was saying earlier, someone tell me, like, wow, you have something to say. Mm. And um, even applying to UCLA the first try, I just, I didn't really think that that was, I didn't know I could do it, right, until I had someone saying, hey, I think you have an interesting perspective of the world, and I think that's what we're all bringing as, um, Latina women, it's like we need that perspective. It's so sorely mm -hmm. needed. Mm -hmm. And if we don't share, if we're not out there making our work, then, you know, I don't know. So it's, it's um, 
yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to pick up on a thread that's come up as I've been listening to all of you. And you know, there's been a lot of conversation uh, in the media about the lack of representation in Hollywood. And each of you have talked about how you've brought yourselves into the work and have been uh, sharing your stories through the work. And I'd love to hear from each of you, you know, what do you think it is going to take in order to have Latinas the Latinx community, other marginalized communities that have not been adequately represented, actually represented at scale. You want to start, Eliana? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. That's a great question. I, I yeah. think it, it's, it's a, that's a, you know, I, it's a complicated question. And I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I also teach at UT, and I just was on another panel where it almost starts there, but also who's funding what and who are the gatekeepers, right? Um, who's taking a chance? And, you know, for me, it took so many years to even get funders on board because the thing with funding too, it's like, oh, if, if someone funds you, then other funders will want to get on board, right? If they're like, oh, yeah, this person, you know, Sundance is funding them. Cool, then it must be a good project. Let me let me get on, jump on that bandwagon. But I don't think it should be that way. And I think it starts with who are those gatekeepers? Are they people of color? Are they do they understand the nuance, the cultural nuances, right, of our stories? Um, that starts there. But also, who who's in these film schools? How are they? What films are they watching when they're there? what are they being told about what stories they can and can't tell? And so for me as an educator, it starts there. It's like showing work by other women, other Latina women, other people of color, and then also encouraging them just to find their voice, that it doesn't have to always be a typical three-act structure all the time. You don't have to, like, how do we, how do we move away from our own stereotypes or the own stereotypes that we keep perpetuating in our work? I think it starts there as well. It's just a, it's it's a it's not just one one avenue, right? So um, and also helping each other, right? As women, like how once we get to a certain position, how can we help other people who are just trying to get access to funding or um, be on a, be on a set that may want more experience? But you know, how do we also take a chance on people? Um, so yeah, but I, I'd love to hear what the other panelists say. That there's just initial thoughts. Yeah, um, well, the first thing that came to mind when you were asking the question is like yesterday at Latinx House, it was so beautiful to see a lot of incredible Latin American filmmakers that were there just in search of community and just to have conversations. And so community building, what you and Olga have been doing, it's incredibly important for people to feel like their voice is heard and also they can ask questions and, you know, get mentors. Um, I had a few, you know, a, a, a few conversations. It was this wonderful, um, director from here from Texas and she's like, you know, like you you actually were my first choice in this short film that I wanted to do. And then I asked the casting director and she's like, oh my God, like look, this is not gonna happen. Just choose someone else. And I was like, that's not true. Like Aww. so many actors, we want to work with first time directors all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if if you if you have like a beautiful working career, then you have the means to actually one time every year to give an opportunity, you know, to a first time director. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's, and I think people, I think people don't realize that. And I wish maybe it would be wonderful to do like an actors uh, colleges kind of exchange where like actors that are working can go and talk to filmmakers mm -hmm. and have conversations and then say like, you know what, I just have a week, but if you can fit it in, I'll come and do your short film. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that would be something that it would be lovely to develop with Latinx House, you know? Um, <laughs> and um, the other, the other um, also like, you know, South by South, like you were saying about, like the you know the the pilot program. Um, same thing with the Sandance Institute. Uh, Sandance has been has 
they've been incredible, incredible fostering Latin American filmmaking. Um, we did Motorcycle Diaries ages ago, <laughs> 20 years ago, but that was a film that started at the, at, at the lab. And uh, our film with Francisca started at the lab too. Um, they have equal, for years, they've had equal opportunities for female and male directors, and they always have one or two Latin American directors. It's a huge percentage. I don't think they get enough credit for it. Um, so just working with you know, film festivals and getting grants and, uh, and also producing. Producing, it's extremely important. Um, I'm, I'm producing a film with a dear friend of mine, Lucio Castro, who's an incredible Argentine filmmaker. He won many awards with his first film, End of the Century. I don't know if you saw it, but it's a gem. And we did that film, we shot it in, in Barcelona for $30,000. It won over 10 awards all over the world. Um, we have a new script that uh, David Hinoza is producing, who's an incredible indie director. And, uh, but it's taken a little bit of a while for us to do it. So we just wrote a new script and we're kind of like rogue, produce it, and for no money, just like a crew of four people, and just do it ourselves. So I think it's also finding, sometimes we wait for a lot of money to do projects. Mm. We don't need that much money sometimes to do indie films, and I think there's a level of um, creativity and surprise that sometimes you get if you have a small crew. Um, that sometimes is lost if you have like a crew of like 30 or 40. I remember when we were doing Motorcycle Diaries and it was, you know, um, the movie that Walter did after, after Central Station and we got and we were shooting in Argentina and then Walter was like, kind of like, not in a, in a great mood and I was like, what's going on? It's like, well, our crew is too fucking big. <laughs> it's like, I, we have this, you know, we had a Eric Gauthier, wonderful DP from France. Um, he does all the Dardenne Brothers films, beautiful, beautiful artist. And he's like, we are like so many people, I cannot get intimate scenes from the actors. It's a road film, it's a motorcycle you know, film, it's Che Guevara, it's too much luxury <laughs> on the set. And then he reduced the crew, like on the second or third day of, of, um, of shooting. So. Um, sometimes small and less is more creative for the director, for the crew, and for the actors. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. I think everyone has said what I want to echo, but um, to just to add to that, I want to say that we need to elevate together. We need to work with one another. And I always say, you know, don't look up to see who's going to be helping you. Hey, I'm here. No, 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 no. Look over here. Look over here. And then say, I can do this. You can do that. And then we just all work together. And we just have to, I think that really helps us keep the integrity of the stories that we are trying to tell and uh, helps us grow as a, as a beautiful team. I love my team, um, my actors, I, lo I love them. It is intimate. I think it's always intimate, no matter how big my, my person, which I'm, I'm happy to have a, a, a bigger crew that can help me move things along faster. <laughs> so that I mean, the, they're good problems <laughs> to have. <laughs> a little bit bigger, that I can just move a little bit faster to help my actors and the timing and everything. Um, but definitely elevate together. And I think technology has really helped us to catch up to our dreams. And we can learn so much. I don't just mean picking up an iPhone and making a movie. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about access to learning. And that's through mm -hmm. places like the Sundance Institute, that's a collab.sundance.org that I have taken so many classes with that have helped me in the craft to grow in my craft because it does take all of that work. And yes, you can have natural and raw talent, but you should have that and grow more. And there's no reason not to be able to learn what you are passionate about today. Mm.
to take a minute and just honor and celebrate the fact that these incredible Latinas have spent, you know, the last 30 minutes with us talking about their hustle <laughs> to achieve their dreams, okay? No. You know, and, and we have to name that. And I'd love for you to now think about, kind of go back to the start of your careers and think about all of the Latinas who are coming up now. What is something that you wish you had known at the beginning that you'd like to share with them to help them as they begin their careers? You ready? Ooh. You ready? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Um, I think ask for help. I think that's not, I, I think you learn that as you get older, that it's okay to ask for help. And when you're really young, in your teens and 20s, I don't think you're fully aware of that. You know, that, um, that there's a lot to learn and that you're not supposed to know everything. And, um, and that people, you know, especially as they're older, it's this beautiful exchange between maturity and wisdom and someone that is just starting and someone that is in their 30s or 40s, 50s, are actually always looking for that connection with that younger energy. It's a beautiful exchange. And it's one of the, kind of like the golden nuggets of creativity. So yeah, yeah, ask, ask for anything you need. Yep. Thank you. You ready, Elaine? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we need to believe in ourselves and invest in ourselves. Because especially I think in the Latina culture, we're so used to being the caretakers, helping people, and I love that. I, lo I love being, I love produce, I've produced over 50 titles. I love helping other people get to where they wanna be. And then at some point, I think it's very important as an artist, as you're growing and, and you're realizing that you're helping other people get to where they are, um, I think it's important to say it's time for me to help me get to where I want to mm. be. And so definitely invest in yourself and uh, at the same time understand that you can be someone else's, your vehicle is actually someone else's vehicle as well. Mm. So like I think of my project as like, yes, this is my vehicle, however, my actors, Karina Ortiz, Gabriele Mirth, Javier Munoz, I mean, Pierre Jean Gonzalez, Summer Rose Castillo, Kevin Chacon, I'm trying to name everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, Camora Cuadrado, Neo Vela. I want them uh, uh, to also feel that this is something that is also elevating, and, and they, they do, they already know that this is elevating to our community, otherwise they have no reason to be in something that is so, um, you know, low budget. <laughs> low budget, but big looking. <laughs> but it's because of their, their help, so um, I just wanna note that, and, and yeah, let's look to each other and know that we can be our own vehicle and we need to invest in ourselves and know that others will see this as an investment in themselves as well, like I hope my actors do, because I'm so proud to show them to the world. Thank you. Um, I, I think I would say to really just stay true, true to your work true to yourself um, and not, it's so easy to, I think, give in to the pressure of this industry and also to just quit. Um, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've applied to grants and been rejected so many times. <laughs> and keep, you know, I, I, and then I'd keep applying and keep going or doing, you know, I think, uh, what did I do? The, the, the you know the Berlin Out of Talents like years ago. I mean I think you know I had applied like twice for that and then got in. And same thing with Sundance. Um, I, then I did a development fellowship through them and then got more funding. But so it, you'd be surprised, right? I think how what the perseverance like you you need perseverance, right? And you know many years ago I had approached a director 
um, at a, it was like a, a panel similar to this um, in LA when I used to live there. And I was really just like, oh, I, I want to ask her, like, what, what, what advice does she have? And, you know, she was just like, oh, it's going to be really tough. And it was a bit, um, it wasn't an uplifting message. And I thought, oh, when I've ever, if ever anyone comes to me after a panel and asks me that same thing, I'm not going to spread that kind of negativity. Mm. Um, and that's what I feel, you know, on stuff like this. And I just wanted her to be like, yeah, it's going to be fucking hard, but you can do it, right? Just someone to at least give you some sense of like, yes, it's difficult because it is hard, but it's not impossible. Mm. Um, and uh, the other day I did another one of these about like decolonizing the classroom, right? Mm. Um, and I had a, 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 a young woman approach me um, and she was a woman of color, Indian, and she's like, you know, I really want to take film classes, but my parents are immigrant parents and they think that I'm not this isn't sustainable and I shouldn't go into this. And then I said, "Tell I'll, we'll, I will talk to them for you. <laughs> I will talk to them for you, bring them to my class, take my class. And I said, if it's in you and you wanna do it, please do it. Because, you know, at least, you know, for me, I didn't think this was sustainable years ago, but somehow it has been and somehow I figured it out and, and I love it and I think that's what passion here with everyone here it's like if you love it and you have something to say that's what's important and to follow that gut and I, you know how many times I've also not listened to my gut and then regretted it mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think that's super important as well I mean we instinctively know what's what's good for us and what isn't right um, and I think just leaning more into that leaning more into because we have the answers already it's just a matter of letting them play out and uh, yeah, following that instinct, and I think that's it. You know, I, um, I, it's more complicated than that, but I think we already we already have what we need inside, and it's just a matter of, of letting that uh, take its course. Can I add something? Of course. It just occurred to me after listening to two beautiful ladies here at my left. Um, I think something that for me it's really important having been in, in the industry for over 20 years now is just stay, I would say, just stay, tell local personal stories. Um, I think the market has opened up so much for Latin actors and stories, yet a lot of the executives are not part of our community mm -hmm. and there's a tendency, a huge tendency to just make everyone the same, every story the same, every food the same. We're all so, every country in Latin America is so different, so beautifully distinct, unique, special. And y we have like something incredible. We have like a huge market in the States and they're like really eager for our own stories and mm -hmm. Latin stories. But let's not make everyone the same, That's you know? Because right. I think right. when we tell really, really, like, personal, um, um, you know, just, like, personal um, argumentos, stories, um, 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 then people connect with that. What people do not connect is when we sell this, like, general idea of what Latin is, you know? Because yeah. that's totally against what actually Latin is. That's right. So I think there's a way of like educating certain executives and streamers that, you know, it, it's not a Latin story, it's a Peruvian story, it's a Colombian story. It's, it's, it's a Latin story from Texas. Um, so, you know, and it won't be the same thing to do a Latin story from the border that someone that grew up in Austin. So I think that's, that's kind of crucial and we haven't tackled that yet. And Thank you. I have to say just one thing. The more specific a story is, the more universal it becomes. Mm. Trust it. Mm. Always. Yeah. Thank you. I want to spend a, a minute giving some love to, to the co-founder of the Latinx House, Olga Segura. <laughs> if you don't know her, she's magic. She's love embodied. Mm -hmm. And she has been fighting for a long time to build this Latina pipeline and conceptualized a new project that we have um, called the Adelante 
Directors Fellowship, which is a project in partnership with Sundance Institute, Netflix, and Shondaland. And I just want to give her a lot of love for what she's creating and building. So we're going to end with a call to action, but I'm going to open it up for questions um, from the audience. Question from Laura is, uh, when folks are looking for funding to support their projects, um, and particularly thinking about philanthropy, what are some of the key search words uh, that, that you're taking a look at and programs that you're looking for to get the funding that you need for your projects? Yeah, I mean, that's also a complicated question because there, you know, sadly, um, I mean, when I was in film school, we we weren't even, we, we, we didn't even have um, access or just were taught that, right? I've had to learn all that afterwards. And there's no like database. It's like, hey, here, apply to XYZ grant. And this is a specifically, I mean, it's a lot of research and I've done that throughout the years. Um, and luckily, you know, I've, through other projects that I've worked for, I was able to secure funding that way. Like with Ford Foundation, I co-produced co a documentary a few years ago that was at South by called Building the American Dream. And that's how, you know, I knew one of the program officers there. Um, so it, it, sometimes it's word of mouth in that way. Um, and I'm working on another narrative fiction piece right now. And um, Axel Caballero was a former boss of mine a few years ago in LA. He's amazing. And now he's head of Warner 150 and he's, given some development de development money for that fiction feature um, called The Untitled Texas Latina Project. It's an anthology film with five Latina directors telling all of our stories about Texas. But so, you know, a lot of, for me, has been word of mouth or just doing research and searching, but there's very few, uh, there's not very few gui in terms of guidance on that and in terms of searching. I mean, do you mean like online searching? Like what, what we're... Oh yeah, yeah, but I mean it would be, you know, a lot of it there's, in the documentary world, um, the IDA had like a great grant list that I'd go through, or you know, Sundance too, um, it's just been such a great resource, like what Elaine was saying with the collab, but they have a whole list of sometimes grants and just even searching, you know, grants for, 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 for that's what I was saying earlier with documentaries, it's a lot easier, but with fiction, there are some grants, um, but in terms, you know, a lot of it goes it, it, you know, investing, right, or equity financing, and so it, that's a little bit more complicated in that way. Um, but I think with documentary, it, it's just it's a little bit easier to, to have access to, to some of that stuff. And there's a, there's a a lot of grants, and I can talk to you a little bit more afterwards if you're interested in learning more about that. And. I'll say sundance.colab.org, look under resources. They give you a list of things, opportunities that are always coming up. I sign up for everything. I apply to everything. And yeah. every time I do not get it, I get closer to the next one, to the next one, because the, 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 the applications, I always say, is extraordinarily helpful to you as a filmmaker to hone in on your message and the story that you're trying to tell. So, and I, and I always feel like I always, almost there, oh, oh, I made it into the last, this amount of people. And uh, I was just recently up for the Lynn Shelton Award. And uh, I made it into the top 13. At least they, at least they did an article about it, right? Because I always get into like the top three, the top three, the top three, oh no. Uh, but um, also I'm gonna say that there are also programs that are available, like Adelante. I was so excited to hear about the Adelante program. Oh my goodness, I've been aiming toward episodic pilot direct, uh, not pilot directing, episodic directing. And that's a program that actually pays you to go through it, that allows yeah. it, because all of these programs, they're wonderful, they're important, they're necessary, they're uh, an opportunity, and at the same time, they become another hurdle that we must have to jump th through to get to the next level. And that's with, you know, they're all amazing. I'll, I've tried out for everything, I'm still trying, I will continue to try, and, um, but these opportunities exist, and, and we need to keep trying for them, and, and I'm just so grateful that they exist. And, and this Adelante program is something that is so needed, and I, I'm, I'm grateful to you guys. The Latinx House, again, I'll say, I saw it at Sundance in 2020. I was a producer at Sundance in 2017. 
we had like one panel that was on NPR and not everybody was allowed to speak. And there were only a few filmmakers there and we felt very isolated. And then in 2020, we were there before the pandemic. And uh, then I saw the Latinx house and I was, I could not have been happier. Yeah. I felt so great because in 2017, there was the black house and the this yeah. house and the that house. And I, and I love, they made us feel welcome, yes. But the Latinx house exists and um, that's another place where we go for resources to understand what's available to us and film festivals like South by Southwest and getting to know other filmmakers that are, that are doing the things that we're doing in the short film category, in the feature category, in, in every category. We look to each other to, um, to help each one another. Thank you. Um, I think the United States is in a kind of like a difficult situation in terms of like investing and giving grants to um, especially first timers, uh, first time directors. Um, it's easier once you're in the industry because it's more word of mouth, you have friends, people get excited, you've done a, a beautiful first film so people want to invest in the next one, you know, you go to dinners. But how can we help first time directors? How can we help those kids right out of college? to do their first film. Um, it's some other countries like France, Germany, Argentina, Chile, you know, they, the government gives them, there's, fu there's government funds. They're huge. Canada is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, Germany is huge. France is like, they support the, the whole French, you know, uh, uh, independent filmmaking. So um, we just have to find a way of just having these grants, and Sundance is incredible. I owe half of my career to them. Uh, Michelle is my hero, but it's all, sometimes it's too big mm -hmm. for a lot of people. So I think we just need to find a way to have like smaller grants. Maybe like, you know, Latinx, like first time directors, or do a collaboration with some universities where there's not maybe not a lot of money, but something for someone to start like a small, you know, a short film or a small project. So. Um, I think we need to get creative on, on that front yet, you know. Um, Spanish is the, you know, in the United States, after Mexico is the country where Spanish is the most spoken all over the world. Uh, millions and millions of people. So there's, you know, maybe there's a specific grant for Spanish speaking films. You know, I don't think there's a lot of that in the United States. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to think about and just to investigate in, in, in that world. There are 62 million Latinx people in the United States. Less than 1% of all philanthropic dollars are invested in our community. In fact, it went from 1% to 0.8% last year. I just have to add that um, there are artists, uh, uh, fiscal sponsors. I am fiscally sponsored through Fractured Atlas I made what is here at South by Southwest Brownsville Bread with a grant from the 150 team who have been amazing. And also I raised money through my fiscal sponsor at Fractured Atlas and every dollar that was donated is a tax deductible donation. And I think of that as yeah. to an investor, that's soft money, we don't have to pay that back. Help me finish this, look yep. what we have so far. Mm -hmm. And so I hope to, I, I, Fractured Atlas or, or other fiscal sponsorships. Other filmmakers need to know about them. Well, thank you. We're going to enlist you as our partner in Ally Laura. Thank you for graciously taking that question from me. Um, I want to just name one thing before we're out of time, and, I, and I'd like the panelists to be able to do their call of action. Uh, at the Latinx House, we created a partnership with the Ford Foundation to establish um, a series of critical conversations with foundations of all sizes to educate them on the critical issues that matter to the Latinx community because we are not just one, we're not a monolith, we also are not just about one issue. So we are engaging in these conversations to try to help explain to philanthropy what it is that we need and how they can best support our community, including giving dollars to make projects like these. So I just wanted to mention that. So I'm gonna turn it to you now. What is your call to action to close up this panel? Um, first of all, I just wanna add, 
uh, our industry is so fast-paced right now, it's changing so rapidly. The fact to say that there's a lot of money for documentaries, to say that right now, like 15 years ago, everyone would have laughed in the room, <laughs> you know, because you couldn't get a documentary off the floor. So um, just to keep that in mind, you know, there's a lot going on happening very quickly and we can make huge changes in very little time. My call to action is to create with Olga a, a beautiful exchange between uh, actors and universities. Yeah, just to do it. And then we can have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> Great, writing that down on our list. Yeah. <laughs> My call to action would be to do, act. Don't just talk, act. Whatever your dream big and act on it, start pursuing that goal and everything that you take on that's going to take you away from that goal, you need to let go of. Mm. It's okay to take on a lot of things and that could be for financial reasons, that could be for other artistic reasons, but you need to do this and aim squarely at your goal so that you can get there and keep going. Act on your dream today. Uh, I think mine is um, to challenge ourselves. I think, you know, uh, what's interesting right now is black filmmakers are having like a renaissance right now. I was just with, on, with Yaki um, Smith on a panel and he, he spoke of it as a renaissance. I feel like our renaissance is yet to come. Mm. It's, it's getting there, but um, yeah, we're, kind, we're behind. And so how do we challenge ourselves as filmmakers um, to make films that aren't, are, you know, just like um, what Mia was saying earlier, there's so many stories yet to be told, right? And we're only seeing certain ones now, and why? I mean, we're just, we have such a rich cultural history and the, the stories aren't being told and we're still, I see a lot of Latino content and it's still within a certain framework told from a certain point of view. We're still getting stuck in our own stereotypes, still telling, you know, re it's like, Come on, guys! Like I think there's we can we can do a lot more, and so that's my call to action. How do we challenge ourselves, and how do we start cultivating community within people you already know, um, and building your own team now? Can you and, you and you can do that now? So that's that's my call to action. Mia, Elaine, Eliana, we honor you, we thank you, and we celebrate you. And we celebrate you. Yeah.